Board Class. Welcome to Automatics 179A. I'm Professor John Acosta, and today we'll be concentrating on crossing the bridge between art and science. And our motto for this class is Left Brain North Campus. Let's have some fun. Oh, I forgot to mention, my office hours are February 29th, 12 to 1. I know that's only every four years, but we have to make do. It's in the Acosta Center, room 79. So let's, get, let's begin. So first we're going to start with cognitive modeling, because art together is a combination of all the human aspects, the ability to create sound, the ability to create physical art, painting, drawing, abstract, everything within your mind. So first we're going to begin with how the brain works in a basic way. Every human has their sensual systems, and they perceive the world, the external world, based on this simple diagram. So we have manual control and visual perception, and that's how we physically take in our world. And these go to our production system, which is just the main part of the brain. I don't want to get too complicated, but this is how it's going to work. Then, from our production system, we can produce our declarative memory, our control state, and our problem state. So the ability to control what we've learned and the ability to solve the problems of what we're doing. This entire diagram is based on the ACTR theory, which is just adaptive control, thought, rational. And it's, it's a pretty basic thing, but break it down your syllabus, just take a look at it after class. Next, we're going to talk about a response system called BOLD, otherwise known as the blood oxygen level dependent responses. When you look at how people respond to the world, everyone responds in a different way, and that's because they use um, different types of variables to describe their ability to respond to situations. And one of the largest variables I found through my research is the blood oxygen level at the time of experience. So we've created this equation which models those responses. And it's a pretty simple equation, nothing uh, out of the ordinary. Uh, the, the T in the equation represents time units, S is just a scalar time quantity, M is the magnitude of the response, and A is the shape of the response. So it depends on the kind of situation you're testing, but it's, it's a pretty basic breakdown. And then finally, we're going to talk about re-representation. And is it a uniquely human trait? We don't know. But we've done tests to say that in over, over time that people are actually, they have, let's see how we're going to put it, slight variances that make sure that all humans can't be treated the same way. And we tested that by teaching young children how to do algebraic manipulation. And not all of them perform it in the exact way we taught it. They're able to change ways in their mind and create new solutions uh, that way. All right, so let's move on from cognitive modeling to human hand dexterous manipulation. So when you talk about people creating art, you know, you have the aspects of painting, you have the aspects of sculpting, you have the aspects of drawing, and many other more that actually physically require, you know, tactilic ability. In moving. So what we've done, with, in collaboration with Stanford, have we have um, created a mathematical model for the dexterity of one's hands and their ability to create art that way. So Stanford has a technology called the Cyber Glove, which models all the forces and torques in your hand, from your fingertips, from your knuckles, from your thumb to your palm. Every single way that your hand can be physically quantified, they've done that. And just a small uh, tip that's not really important for your final, but it's called fingertip separation linearity. And that's, that's the thing, um, that's a phenomenon known, is where if you separate each finger into its own entity, it's going to act differently than when it's connected to your whole hand and working as one. So it's, it's quite interesting. So before I get into the complex matrices of this, I'm going to show you guys just a quick model to show how Stanford is represented their hand with the models. So give me a second here. Sorry for the delay, it's just a new classroom. Alright, here we go. So I'm not going to break this all down. You're going to learn this in 179B if you continue with my series. But basically, if you look at every single one of these cylinders, it represents a different uh, rate and rotation of the hand. 
So if you, you know, basically, if you want to look at the hand in simply a quantified sense, this is the way they're doing that. And you can find this on your syllabus as well, or on the class website. But when I break down the equation, you'll see that all of these letters correspond to what we're going to look at. All right. joint matrix, or matrix, sorry, that completely models the ability for the hand to move. And I'm not going to break down this entire equation like I said, but it's based on this one, this one very simple linear equation where this represents the set of joint angles, G represents the sensor gains, because it's just, it's just the basic sensor you place on your hand, and sigma represents the raw sensor values. So that's, that's essentially how we've quantified the dex, dexterity aspect of art. Next. We're going to move on to my favorite section of the class where we talk about the hippocampus, the imagination, and the memory uh, aspect of this class. So, the hippocampus is a small portion of your brain which works um, to help transfer memories from long term or from short term to long term. So, this is going to sound quite complicated as we go through the entire thing, but first, we're going to start with this basic. Basic theory, it's called the Hebbian Learning Algorithm. So we just break it down. And so learning has to do with uh, synaptic reflexes. So basically in the brain, whenever you get a new, a new signal, a, si a, a, a neuron is going to fire. So what this does, it measures the strength of those neurons firing. So we call that the synaptic strength between the neurons. M over here is the number of memories. And IJ is just from the I neuron to the J neuron. So this just breaks that down pretty basically. Um, so there's two types of networks in the brains that we've coined. It's called the CA3 network and the CA1 network. The CA3 network is just, it's, it's a connection between excitatory neurons and inhibi in, in, in inhibitory neurons to have them work together to create memories. And the CA1 is just mostly negative feedback through Inhibitory cells? Yeah, you have a question? Yeah, Professor, are you saying that the memory of the brain can be broken down into a mathematical equation? Of course. Everything can be broken down into math. And that's what this course is trying to show. This is just one simple aspect of math, and, or one simple aspect of the brain, and that's learning, because we're going to try to apply this to the creation part. Okay, let's keep moving on here. So the CA1 network mostly works through inhibitory cells. So before we get to the relationship between those two, I'm going to talk about temporary associative memory. So as soon as you experience something new, your brain automatically creates a memory. But that memory is based on things that you experience that around. So say, you know, say you go to an awesome football game, right? Your memory isn't just the football game, it's the people you were with, the food you were eating, whatever you were drinking, what you were wearing, if you were cold, if you were hot. All those memories, or that single memory has a whole slew of memories with which it's associated. And another theory that more explains that is called chaotic itinerancy, which is just dyna dynamic message linking in the brain. So from what you've experienced, the brain can actually mesh all those together to create the essence of one memory, but it actually is many memories. Now this equation is way beyond your scope. We actually discussed this in 179C, but we still, we're still going to use this for what we're going to talk about today. So, going back to the two memory networks I was discussing, the CA3, so say it's damaged. When you try to recall memories, like we talked all the way back here in the cognitive modeling section, fabrication can occur. So what we've seen with interviewing and studying many artists is that their ability to recreate things in their own way actually has to do with the damaging of their CA3 networks. And because the CA3 to the CA1 is unidirectional, if the decoding mechanism of the CA1 is broken, the neocortex can't receive information and recall can be damaged. So if you can't get perfect recall from the CA1 and the CA3 is damaged, that's creating a new 
like a new perception of what actually happened. So we really like that. That's one of the most interesting topics. We'll talk about that later. And then the final thing we're going to talk about today is the auditory systems. Because, you know, art isn't simply just the tactile creation. You know, music is art, you know, playing instruments. All different types of sounds are art. So we look at this pretty simply. We're not going to go anything, anything too complicated, but within the auditory system, inside our ears, we have a uh, small structure called the base of our membrane. And when we hear sounds, it actually transforms the vibrations into electrical signals that our brain can process. So, what we've done here is we've created this equation to model that. And there's a whole ton of variables here, but we're just going to let those be. And we're going to apply that at the end when we're going to break this up now. But the most important thing I like to talk about in this section is auditory transform. So like I was saying, the basilar membrane transforms those, um, transforms those vibrations into electrical signals to the brain. And that's what this entire equation represents. So in our overall trying to prove how we're going to make science into art, this is just used to create this equation. Now, We've broken down the four most important aspects of the human, and we've quantified everything that we can quantify. So what we need to do now is somehow figure out how we're going to apply this to art. Now, I'm not going to completely show you the entire mathematical breakdown in this class, but what I've done is I've used every formula we've shown from the hand dexterity manipulation to the hippocampus to the auditory, to the cognitive modeling. And I plugged it into what I like to call the Acosta algorithm. And we'll completely break that down in 179B. But here's the fascinating thing. When I process it in my computer, it, it cannot be solved. So what I want you guys to think about is why can't this be solved? Why does my extremely powerful computer not have the ability to process this simple algorithm? Or is it simple? That's the question, class. So I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you my computer processing this algorithm, and then we're going to discuss what you think. So let me hit the lights. It's a little tough to see. But I've been running this algorithm now for 12 years, ever since I began researching this project, and it hasn't stopped. And I've made many, many alterations to the algorithm to see if it could expedite its completion. But I've just been unable to do so. So, I'm sort of going to reveal the end of my story to you. Even though you're going to take the rest of my studies. But here's, here's essentially what happens. When you break down the entire algorithm into its basic components, you find that infinity equals infinity, which we all know just can't happen. It's unbelievable. So what I've come to the conclusion, oh, yes, you have a question. Professor, are those eights or infinities? Oh, that's an infinity. I'm sorry. All right, thank you. Don't worry about it. So the overall conclusion that I've come to is that you cannot possibly quantify the magnificent realm of art in one scientific equation. It is not. It is not possible. And I've coined this term to be the Acosta Automatic Paradox. Art is simply too vast of a field with too many boundless opportunities to quantify into one equation. It's like trying to put a bunch of crazy kids in one little sandbox and expecting them to stay there. In possible. So that's what I'd like to show you in class today and I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you next year.